Hey everybody, welcome to the Dreamer's Edge Podcast 2012! Yay! Yay. Alright, I've uh, we're a small little bunch today. I've got to my left. Yanis, how you doing everybody? I'm uh, a subtitle editor, sometime cocktail genius. <laughs> hey. Alright, and this is Chris, um, occasional writer and editor as well. And I'm Dimitri, webmaster of DreamersEdge.com and movie critic. And also we have today a very special guest star, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Nick Nolte in the room with us. Why did you get on the ship? <laughs> nice to see you. It's an honor. <laughs> Pleasure. Me too. <laughs> All right, no, actually, what we, who we have here with us as well is... Oh, I'm Eric. Sometimes writer, full-time teacher. Yes, and today we are going to talk about 2011 and 2012. Actually, we're mostly going to talk about what we want from 2012, since this is a new year and we're all looking forward to it. Now, we'll kind of start with something I like to call show and tell, and we're going to do something different. Instead of making recommendations, we're going to talk to you about a little bit about uh, uh, what came as a surprise to us in 2011. So in case you missed it, you can uh, maybe catch it, although we'll probably have spoiled it for you at this point. <laughs> Why don't you get us started, uh, Nick Nolte? Yes. <laughs> uh, what came as a surprise to me uh, this year? Uh, actually, recently, uh, I just watched uh, the movie Warrior, and quite frankly, I never expected it. I'm not a big fan of uh, those big UFC or MMA, the, the whole thing, but uh, for some reason, that movie really worked. And... Uh, I I didn't expect to enjoy a kind of film like that. And okay, I'm gonna say this. Uh, usually when it's Friday, I'm I'm pretty tired because I'll teach and uh, I get home and I'll watch a movie and most of the time I fall asleep on it. That movie I watched till the end and I was so invested. In terms of you know surprises of the year 2011, um, I have to say that. That was the biggest surprise for me too. Like I, I, I like the sports genre as mm -hmm. long as there's no animal in it. <laughs> you know, you know, air, air pooch or whatever. Right. You know. okay. <laughs> <laughs> the underdog sports movie where the dog is the underdog. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of, and there's more movies in that genre than you would care to admit. Yes, I love the karate dog personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, they, they follow beats. You kind of knew what you were going to get, so I wasn't in a hurry to watch it. But when I did see it, it. Uh, Blew me away. It was just yeah. was really good. Tom Hardy was awesome. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Nick Nolte. If you can maybe tell me a little bit about your uh, acting. <laughs> no, I can't. Don't get on the ship. Shit. No. <laughs> no, but Nick Nolte himself was good. He's maybe for me almost the, the weakest part of the movie, just because of one of the tropes that he's got as a as a character. But the two characters who are doing the fighting are each believable um the fighting itself you know again as a non mixed martial arts fan um looked real to me you know the choreography of the fighting you know was good you know like it was exciting kinetic energetic you know yeah and what's more it sort of reflected their personality it's not just like yeah. cut away to fight and then they fight yeah. and whether or not their victory matters it the way they approach the ring actually said something about the characters yeah. you know yeah I'm, I'm with both of you guys i started of a press screening and i was blubbering like little girl in the oh, thing because yeah, yeah. it's so I, affecting yeah. oh yeah at the end you're kind of like oh, I, especially with that song from uh, the nationals it works so well yeah. with uh with what's going on uh all right let's move on uh Yanis, uh blew you away in 2011 or at least intrigued you well i would say uh blew me away, but I was pleasantly surprised uh, by uh, a new series from ABC, uh, Happy Endings. Wait, wait, wait. There's a new series from ABC that somebody likes? <laughs> yeah, it's actually hard to believe. I'm not a huge fan of network television, but uh, the Happy Endings sitcom, very good uh, and, and very refreshing from a sitcom angle. Follows the lives of, I guess, late 20, early 30-somethings. And uh, they're all best friends, live in Chicago. Uh, but I think what sets this show apart from others is, one, there's a third more dialogue in the show than any other show running at 22 minutes. Uh, so it's a fast-paced show. And it looks like, so far, uh, it seems to be true, every line of dialogue is a punchline. 
So if there's not something you immediately catch and find amusing, there will be something surely with, you know, 30 seconds from now. Usually in sitcoms, you know, you gravitate to one particular character for an idiosyncrasy or something you find familiar. But in this particular show, uh, they, they all seem to gel really well together and uh, take the time out to point to poke fun at themselves, which, which I find amusing. Yeah, and I think it's something you're starting to see more and more with the sitcoms. It's, I guess, each of the characters is the Kramer character, so to speak. <laughs> That's um, right. Did you say Kramer or Kramer? Kramer. Oh, sorry. It's a character from Seinfeld. I know, but you said Kramer. <laughs> no, I heard Kramer. No, he said You Kramer. just have a dirty mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I didn't even think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was just making fun of his pronunciation, but... It's pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> no, but normally that would grate on me because it just gets too idiosyncratic. It's, you know, everyone's the eccentric, you know. In this one, they play up all those foibles in a really funny way. The characters are engaging. And, you know, I'm not sure. It's But it's one of those shows, and I think you're right. Like, it's just joke a, a second, not joke a minute. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how long you're going to be able to keep that up. It's something like Arrested Development. It's just like by the third season, you're like, my God, I'd hate to be a writer on that show. You know? mm, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and in this one, they usually tend to try and do the, you know, the two or three storylines again. Everyone's doing jokes all the time. You know, and it's just like throwaways after throwaway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's somewhat meta, not to the level of community, but I, you know, for the time it's going to be on, I, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to tune in for sure. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So yeah, it's good. You guys have me sold. I'm definitely going to check it out because I keep catching like the end of it because I have a DVR and it records <laughs> a minute earlier. <laughs> and, yeah, um, I'm going to stay in the realm of television as well. Like you, Yanis, I was a bit disappointed uh, by network television. Well, you is more of a constant thing. For me, it's this year. This year has been pretty bad for network TV, I find. Nothing much of interest, uh, but there's one show that actually surprised me quite a bit uh, because I thought it was going to be trashy as hell, but uh, Revenge actually... <laughs> is trashy as hell but like in all the right ways it's like watching dynasty with like all the rich people doing crazy stuff that you want to slap them in the face except somebody in the show actually does it for you uh it's this girl whose father was framed for essentially 9-11 tasty and uh she comes back changes her identity and uh, goes back to the family that framed her father and inserts herself into their circle to destroy it from the inside essentially okay yeah, I've been, yeah, I think it was you that was telling me about it. I still haven't gone back. I think it's just restarted now. I think we're airing right. It just came yeah. back from, um, yeah, I might check out a couple episodes. Just It seems like it could be fun, you know, just a little bit soapy, but, you know, interesting. Yeah, and it's cool all the literary references they have in there. Like, well, of, of course, they're doing Account of Monte Cristo, but uh, they, just, they did a couple of references uh, to Cyrano de Bergerac. Uh, okay. In in this episode, and during Sweet, they had an episode where a new character came in to sort of shuffle the cards around who had his own agenda, and essentially he was Mr. Ripley from the talented Mr. Ripley. And mm -hmm. they do these little neat little things like that. It's actually kind of, kind of fun. Oh, okay. It's funny, we're all talking TV, and um, now it's making me want to think about something different. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's true, I really think that 2011 for me was kind of a, a year of television. Like, it just, uh, I was surprised with a lot of the stuff I saw, even, you know, even though. Certain shows that I really liked had kind of come to an end, you know, um, The Wire or Battlestar, and like I would, and I think I was maybe watching a little bit more TV than I generally do, just looking to fill that gap <laughs> in a way. And so I sampled a few things, um, and I think the biggest uh, surprise for me for 2011 though was um, Sherlock. It's a BBC series. Um, oh yeah. It's a three episode um, arc generally. And each episode is an hour and a half, so it's just like they're like mini movies. I don't know how they're aired necessarily, but it's with Benedict Cumberbatch, whose name I love. <laughs> and I think he's going to be in The Hobbit uh, as the dragon, actually. That's right, yeah. And, but he's also just recently in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, and, and he really does a really good performance there. An interesting guy who actually talked him, himself out of a kidnapping in South uh, Africa. Oh, yeah. Really? He wrote these guys that were about to put him in the trunk and uh, ransom him, and he's like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. I have a heart condition, and... You don't want me to, and yeah, ended up talking his way out of it. Wow, mm. he's he's got a bit, very strange, almost alien-looking face. You know what I mean? Like there's something <laughs> about him, like, is perfect but for it Sherlock works Holmes. so well for Sherlock, exactly, yeah. just because he's 
he just looks like he's cut from alabaster and he's just like this weird otherworldly person who's just got his obsessions and but what they've done with this Sherlock series is that they've, you know, counter to, you know, the, the Guy Ritchie, you know, um, steampunkish <laughs> series that, you know, is in the theater. This BBC series is kind of a reboot of modern time. Mm. Um, the Watson character is, you know, basically a soldier from oh, Afghanistan. Okay. He comes back with an injury from, you know, a recent war. He's looking to establish himself in London. Can't afford it. Maybe his injury is psychosomatic. Who knows? And then there's Sherlock Holmes, who like the actual Sherlock from the short stories by Conan Doyle, he's obsessed with like um, everything ephemeral, you know, just like uh, the tabloids and this and that. So what is he going to um, gravitate to, of course, is, you know, Twitter and <laughs> texting and all these things. And so there's a real mm -hmm. drive of the technology and how he uses technology to kind of like just like absorb things and like memorize things and look at things and contact people. And, and he mm -hmm. plays it up in a really inter interesting character. Um, the... Watson character is also going to be in The Hobbit, uh, but what's his name? He's, he's uh, actually The Hobbit. He's Tim from yeah, Tim from, uh, Tim from the, the UK office. office. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, I'm blanking on his name. And they just they they're really good together. They play it up well. Oh, that does sound very interesting. So that was awesome. my that was my yeah. most interesting. You know, like I didn't quite you know I'm a big fan of the mystery genre, but I've never necessarily been a big fan of the core text of the Conan Doyle mm -hmm. stories. You know. I like the ideas, you know, and but I don't really go back and like, you know, reread them because they're so much fun. Um, as much as every now and then I, I try to, because I think it's supposed to be good for me. But <laughs> <laughs> but this show is awesome. Uh, it makes reference to certain stories, you know. But um, I'd recommend it. But you know, this was a bit of a surprise. But thing, I think the thing that really amazed me, um, and maybe something we can I would talk about a little bit more, is the um, the Game of Thrones. I just really didn't think fantasy would get a buy-in on such a broad scale, you know, with the number of people that I've spoken to who got so into it, who never read fantasy books, who never, you know, so in terms of, you know, it makes sense that somebody's going to buy the Dan Brown books and, you know, they, you know, that's a mystery. That's fine. But it makes no <laughs> sense that I'm talking to my mother and she wants to read Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, yeah. That is interesting. You know, so I found but for me that was the biggest surprise. But in the Game of Thrones, though, like you do get this power struggle between the houses. You're tossed into this world that has its own logic, but there's also this thing where it's not really about magic with wizards so, that are. So the fantasy is the vehicle, but it's not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. It, it is like in this land of fantasy, but it's really right. about like people that are trying to get power and everything. But and it's not a new trope. It's it's one of those no, fantasy novels it, where it takes place one... in a fantasy world where kind of magic has died, so to speak. And man, you know, in, and Lord of the Rings is almost like that at a certain level too. People mm -hmm. are kind of just like it's a strange world. No one sees magic as the day-to-day, -day, but it's just like it's more just like the strangeness is a reality. But in this one, it really is kind of like a medieval land. Yeah, exactly. And you have bastards, you yeah. have dwarves, you have like incest, you have like everything else. I that... love you put dwarves with <laughs> bastards and incest. I'm joking. Ch <laughs> <I don't... laughs> That's the way my mind works. <laughs> when a brother and sister have sex. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, you know, so I, for me, I found that was more, uh, interesting cultural development, you know what I mean? It's just, and I'm curious to see where that goes, you know, like, are we going to have more of this type of stuff on um, broadcast television? And I guess maybe we have already with Happy Endings and Grimm. Or, Happy sorry, Endings, sorry. Once Upon a Time. Or oh, Once Upon a Time, sorry. Yeah. yeah, sorry. You know, but so maybe we're moving a little bit away from science fiction and towards this safer realm of just, you know, fantasy nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the fairy tale and you know just like this medieval order i don't know i think it's it comes a lot from the fact that the dork has become mainstream in recent yeah. recent years yeah and that means more point. female dorks and i would say production wise i would think a fantasy setting would be easier no i actually mm, think the opposite like, yeah, yeah. really you think yeah. so yeah. Because you got to film with animals, and because horses. Ah, well, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, I would. I was going like to say cost sets, efficient. The wise. castles, like uh, even a, though you can CGI a lot of that stuff, that but the costumes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Let alone bastard incest ones, but <laughs> <laughs> it's exterior scenes as well, which means you can only film during the day, that's as right. opposed to a spaceship. You know. That's right. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really do think it's uh, women dork uh, uh, are suddenly free to. To be dorks and and take over the market a little bit more so mm. fantasy is going to have a mm. bigger place in the market i think 
yeah, no, I think you might actually be onto something, but um, I hadn't thought about it that way. And so, but I think you might be right. But HBO is a, an interesting kind of phenomenon in itself, like the way that they kind of reinvent the, the genre. And... I don't think they're really reinventing the genre. What they're doing is they're trying to give you a historical depiction of the genre. I think if HBO has a theme as a, as a network, um, it's basically about... Um, certain civilizations you know so yeah. it's, it's rome it's the the mafia it's tri a rebuilding of you know new orleans after the flood yeah it's the social network of medieval worlds makes sense within you know it's not as yeah. strange you know what i mean because it's just it's another extreme you know what i mean like right. whereas rome is the collapse of an empire this one is kind of the you know this fantasy world is basically the the build up of you know a new empire you know like so, you know, I, I do think they've actually got a little bit of a through line. Well, I think the thread, the thread is conflict. realism. They tend to strive for a level of realism that you don't see in other network shows that try to tackle the same subject genre. But there's been a lot of, you know, self-analysis on this in the States as well, just about the idea of their place as you know, an empire. Because mm -hmm. now they've got Treme, they've got uh, Boardwalk Empire, and then they've got Game of Thrones. All these things, I guess, are, you know, if, if I'm going to follow this through logically, are meditations, sorry, on the idea of, you know, collapse, rebuild, sure. um, mm. you know, pivotal moments in history. Well, actually, that leads in quite comfortably into what we really wanted to talk about, which is, you know, what do we expect from 2012? So, you know, using this as a segue, uh, like, do you expect more stories of that kind, that sort of fall of the empire? Well, uh, I think 2012, yeah. the world's supposed to end, right? So yeah. I think it's just a natural progression that, <laughs> but no, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I feel like people want a bit of hope in their life right now, mm. you know? And so I don't know what's in the, the works, you know what I mean? But I feel like something like Avengers might do better than a dark night rising if dark night is too dark again you know it's going to do so so well but if something like avengers has a little bit more of a this group of people that we've been following for so many years you know it finally comes together in this movie and we just feel good in very that bright colors Amer that america has been able to kick ass you know like i think that's almost going to like latch into the zeitgeist of, the, of mm. the, the cultural need more than you know just one man against the world and depressed again you know i don't know i, I feel like i at least maybe i'm just speaking for myself Although, but i feel like there's i we're i feel like people are a little bit starting to get tired of that you know what i mean like so so i don't know you know what i mean like i think we're going to see more stories of collapse but i think we need something a little bit more uplifting you know mm -hmm. well it's, it's funny you say that because i'm trying to think as 2011 the summer blockbusters of 2011 as a model and I can't help but notice that, you know, Rise of the Planet of the Apes was a surprise hit, and that's a kind of a gloomy story. Whereas cat films like Captain America and certainly Green Lantern sort of uh, underperformed a little mm, bit, yeah. and those are actually the hopeful ones. So I think that, you know, right now um, the U.S. economy is in a state where it looks like it's going to be status quo for the next little while. And I think I think a lot of people do feel like one man against the world because everyone feels... Like, yeah, they need a break, absolutely. But I think everyone feels like they're pushing a boulder uphill. My hopeful for 2012 is Prometheus. Mm. Um, it looks like a really exciting film. Uh, obviously, I like Ridley Scott. So I have every confidence that it's, it's going to do well. Oh, yeah. And I like, you know, the idea of the story, the origins of humanity. And uh, from, what, from what I saw of the trailer, looks very, very exciting. And I can see it fitting in to the like the 2012 cultural demand, you know, mm -hmm. what, what do we need? What, maybe we need to return to our roots. Maybe we need to get back to basics to, 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 to beat a dead horse. But, uh, and it's nice because it is a fresh story. It's it not, is a fresh, it's a completely you know, so. fresh story. And, and thank God it's not a reboot, yeah. you know, because Fox decided to do the predator alien mashup that kind of <laughs> murdered that yeah. possibility, Yeah, uh, which is okay. Cause I don't, Want to see any more Predator Alien mashups? No, after the uh, Requiem, I think that, that I was done with that. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for the first one. And I was there for the second one. Yeah. <laughs> and I wondered why. And, uh, you know, uh, The Dark Knight Rises, I'll wait and see what happens. My only disappointment with that, being a Batman fanatic, is that it's over after number three. And any, any possibility oh, of a number four. I think it's smart. Yeah, no, yeah I do too. I do too. But, you know, the, the I kind of respect Christopher Nolan more. I do too. And I, th I think, I think you know, what he's doing is the right thing. My only issue when it comes to superhero films 
is the break in consistency. I wouldn't credit uh, Christopher Nolan's artistic integrity so quickly, though, because it was always part of uh, Warner yeah. Brothers' plans to end it at three, mostly because they're eager to sort of reboot their DC universe and do what Marvel has been yeah. doing and do a sort of a unified universe with yeah. their characters. And, of course, Christian Bale's Batman is set in such a realistic setting yeah. that it wouldn't really match with Green Lantern or whatever. Right. No, no, obviously there's the financial concern, but my concern is always... Well, is that going to be a successful angle? Is he going to be successful, Bruce Wayne? Yeah, you don't know. Like that. But I think and that's the fun. I know. You know what I mean? If you take the idea of a superhero story as, you know, like a form of, you know, shared mythology that, you know, someone just takes a story, tweaks it, retells it. Right. Having someone go in and retell it, just, you know, take it from a different angle. You know, like you realize the character has been told so many times that they've just been polished down to this, you know, yeah. reflective sheen that, you know, means they can be anything, you know, in terms of. Yeah, and, and, and I like that. I like that. You know, people keep talking about the next vision of Batman. You know, like, let's just leave it there. You know, and like 10 years later, we'll do the Frank Miller, you know, Dark Knight Return series. Mm -hmm. Even bring back Christian Bale as, you know, an older man and kind of like try and redo it. I don't know if people are really saying that. I'm just saying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, would be, it would be pretty cool. But the thing is, I think actually it would be kind of fun if they were to kind of reboot something is actually move away from the movies for a while, do a television show, and do it from, like, the Gotham Night... Or is it Gotham Central or Gotham... The, uh, the, the cop series? Oh, yeah. yeah that was awesome. Gotham, Gotham Central. Yeah. Gotham yeah. Central, yeah. Where it's regular cops, hard-boiled writing, yeah. with just this these weird super villains, yeah. you know, who suddenly... In, like, how are you going to fight these guys? And what the <laughs> hell? You know, yeah. like, and suddenly, you know, we're walking yeah. into a room and you get frozen by Mr. Freeze and you're... Yeah, and, and it's kind of funny, even the way they walk into the building and you've got the bot sign that's, like, yeah. up in the air and they hate that. Yeah, and they don't... They absolutely hate that. Because the thing is, Batman isn't everywhere. No. Yeah. It's the cops are, you know, so it's only, like one time in a hundred I'm sure he shows up where they happen to be you know what I mean yeah. and he's probably late most of the time you know? <laughs> uh, and, but I think that would actually be kind of an interesting you know thing to kind of feed the time until mm -hmm. we finally do a movie you know what I mean I don't know okay I, see. I don't know because uh, Birds of Prey did so well you're right yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but they... yeah, DC's done so well with their animated series but like yeah their yeah. live action stuff yeah, it's, 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 they tried it's... to make it like Smallville and uh our biggest surprises from last year were all television, and yet our biggest expectations for next year are all movies. Well, I haven't set right, I guess my not... big expectation, but... Sorry, go for it. Lay it on me. I'm looking forward to Game of Thrones Season 2. That's that's the one thing that uh, I'm really, you know, counting down the days, going like, okay, I, I can't wait to see what they're going to do. Second book is uh, Clash of Kings. And lots of stuff is happening in that book, and I'm like, okay, how are they gonna translate this uh, on the screen? Because I gotta say, like, when I saw Game of Thrones, mm, I was a bit iffy. I read the book, liked it, and then I was like, oh, I don't know how this is gonna translate on the screen. And it worked. I thought they did an amazing job. And also the fact that they had 10 episodes, very compact, like, this is the smart thing of HBO, like, it's always 12 episodes, 10 episodes, very compact and just enough. Sometimes it gets too long. Like uh, I was, you were mentioning revenge and everything. And I'm sure you could, you know, easily shave off like two, three episodes and the story would be that much tighter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the case of revenge in particular, because uh, they didn't know if it was going to get renewed and you could see it. It go towards a very definitive ending and then there was some reshuffling and that's when you had the Japanese guy show up out of nowhere <laughs> <laughs> like, you must complete your training in Japan which was like okay and I was like what? <laughs> and then they never talked about it again <laughs> until in the last episode it, we're going to find out he's a ninja you can see like a lot of plot threads just get fixed the next episode because you know they're going to we're going to do that okay. later you know that's it mm. uh, what I'm looking forward to in 2012 uh, is also in the same category, uh, which is the category known as In Your Face, Chris! Uh, also <laughs> television. <was> movie. <laughs> <laughs> but um, The Walking Dead, uh, the season two, had a really rough start because 
of infighting with the network and the creators. But what is up with AMC? They are always about to lose their writers. They had like uh, the same thing almost happened with uh, Mad Men well, and Breaking Bad. That's yeah, quite yeah. negotiations for Mad Men, yeah. Yeah, but that's not so surprising. It's because they don't have HBO's resources they don't have the and, and they don't have the budgets, but they want to uh -huh. make shows with that same pedigree. Well, they don't own that many shows, and the one show they own is AMC, mm -hmm. and they couldn't end Mad Men, from what I understand, and they and now they've partnered up to keep Breaking Bad go, but it's just, it's begin, it's be, they've screwed themselves with the Mad Men, mm -hmm. yeah. so they couldn't afford <laughs> some yeah. of the stuff on AMC, yeah. Yeah. and that's the problem that you're talking about. That's exactly it. So, no, it's not surprising that's happened, because, you know, all these creators want the budget to make those great series that they've been commissioned to do, but yeah. AMC just doesn't have the funds for it. No. Mm -hmm. But they are stuck in that bind, and the season two of Walking Dead started off moderately slow and, you know, visually boring. It really, it's the stories were still good. The characters were still interesting, but it's just like it was always the same farm and always the same forest, and it's just bad. But they sort of paid it all off in the final scene of the mid-season finale, and just when I was about to go, maybe I should give this up. They just redeemed everything and made it awesome again, and I'm actually really looking forward to their comeback in 2012. Uh, especially since that's going to be the episodes where they no longer have Frank Darabont's uh, influence on it, and it's going to be the completely new creative team, who, to be honest, I like better anyway. Oh, I didn't realize he was in any way involved in the beginning of season two. Yeah, he, he uh, was. Okay, yeah. okay. So that should be really interesting. Um, and the other show I'm looking forward to, to is the uh, series finale of The Closer. Uh, that's a TNT show, for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's about a is Dallas... Is Close? No, no, she's not going to let it. Kara Sedgwick? That's who it is. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, some, a show that maybe mimics that style is probably Body of Proof. Mm -hmm. You have a strong female lead who basically is your crime fighter slash solver. And, uh, I mean... I, from the closer, that's what I remember from the seasons that I've seen. But maybe it's maybe it's gone elsewhere. Yeah, it's a little bit more politically oriented. Because the, the thing with the closer, it started off with her being a, a very agile cop, but one hell of a liar. <laughs> and, but the thing what they did is that every time she moves up the food chain within the department, mm -hmm. and every time politics get a larger role in her life more and more. And now that we've reached the final season, they're paying all of that off where mm. it's all politics that are just taking over her job right now. And they've introduced a new, some new characters. It's really, really fascinating right now. It really is a, heading towards a conclusion that will feel like a conclusion to her life, to that character's story within the show, within six, seven seasons of the show. So well, in that case, listeners, that. it's nothing like Body of Proof. <laughs> <laughs> I take it all back. <laughs> um, for me, <laughs> Dimitri, I think I'm going to actually rip up your... Um, your television thing, but... Uh, wow, you your argument was, like, completely crap, huh? Oh, we're all looking forward for Yeah, movies. no, because, you know, because actually what I'm interested in is Brian K. Vaughan, the creator of Walking Dead, is returning to comic books this year uh, uh, with a new comic uh, called Saga. Oh. And it's uh, kind of a space... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Brian K. Vaughan didn't invent uh, no, Walking he did Dead. Wild oh, Last you're Man. right. Oh, my That's God. That's Kirkman. He did, he did yeah. Why the Last Man. Yeah. yeah. Why the Last Man and, and uh, Ex Machina. Yeah, I like that. Okay. And he's got this new series, which is basically going to be a, a family trying to survive in the middle of like an intergalactic war. And so it's going to be a space opera. I'm, really, I'm curious to see where he goes with that, because I've, I've, I'm sure he's done it, but I haven't followed his career closely enough to see what he does with science fiction or fantasy mm -hmm. style in that, to that level. So I'm, I'm curious. But then I'm back to television then. So Saga, yes. Mm -hmm. But actually, the biggest thing I'm looking forward to is um, comic book related somewhat, but going back to television is the um, adaptation of um, Brian Michael Bendis and I think it's Michael Oming. Oh, um, Powers. Powers. It's a cop story where it's basically, there are superheroes out there, but superheroes have been somewhat outlawed. outlawed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's... A division within the police force who specialize in tracking them down or dealing with superhero crime uh, or supervillain crime. And one of the main people on that task force, it turns out, was actually their former Superman of this world. And whether he's lost his powers or decided not to use his powers, you're not quite sure at the beginning. But I think this one might actually be the it, minimally special effects driven, you know what I mean, in a way. So I think it actually might be able to kind of enter that world 
in a way that you know that you could afford on a television budget yeah. or a network television budget sure. week yeah. by week. Mm -hmm. And if you've got good stories, then you can still have a weekly, you know, like mystery of the week, you know, with like a through arc, you know, and I think it actually might add up well. Having read some of the later issues of Powers, it, it goes into territory that I don't think is really easy to adapt to television. It gets very no. meta. No. Uh, but I think it's one of those concepts that they should really mostly take the concept and run yeah, with it. Yeah, I think it's going to go its own route, for yeah. sure. You know, uh, if it does, you know, because, yeah, some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole episode of just, like, the cavemen fighting each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it actually might be a good in for, you know, because I don't think that uh, ABC... What was it no ordinary family did too too well? No, no. no and you know, I think Heroes kind of disappointed me as well. So, <laughs> you? <laughs> How about the just cape? You. Yeah, I'm just saying. You know, <laughs> Chris. How about the cape? Well, the cape. I don't think it had its chance to fly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Get out, everybody. Why did you make that joke? <laughs> <laughs>